Barbados, Morax, Beelzebub, Boar, Folklore. You may know them as the five Archons in Genshin Impact, whereas I, the proudest Christian in all the lands, know them as just some of the 72 demonic entities listed in the occult book, The Ars Goetia. However, it extends beyond this. It would seem as if most gods in Genshin Impact have a corresponding demon name in the Ars Goetia, even those that were never Archons. For example, Orobashi is quite similar to the demon Orobas, Istaroth has Astaroth, and Dekarabian has Dekarabia. And then there's Paimon, whose demon name is Paimon. It's interesting to note that even among the gods that go by no other names, this is the first time there's a straight one for one rip out with no alteration whatsoever. Putting that aside for now, not only do the gods borrow the names of the demons, but they also borrow their traits. I did a more in-depth video explaining this if you're interested, but to give you a short rundown, the demon Barbados has a connection to animals, is a master of communications, and has four kings. Venti's musical proficiency makes him a master of communications. Couple this with the fact that he has the four winds, which are all animals, you can see the similarities with the demon Barbados. Going on, the demon Morax is extremely knowledgeable and summoned for the purposes of revealing hidden truths of this world and has the power to shapeshift. Zhang Li is said to have taken on many forms and is renowned for his unending knowledge. Baal is a demon depicted with three heads which is reflected in game due to A, Makoto, and the Raiden Shogun all being the same entity but different individuals. Boar is a demon who heals diseases and promotes the teachings of philosophy. Nahida cured Elazar, kinda, and is the god of wisdom in a nation where discussion is encouraged. I might as well do Folklore since we're here even though we don't have the full picture yet. Folklore, yes, it is said Folklore, it's a Latin word where there was no suh sound, it's hard cut, say it with me, Folklore, don't, 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 just because this anime game says Folklore, that doesn't make it right in the real world where dolphins and other things exist, it's Folklore, Folklore! Folklore is a demon with control over the seas and is notable for being kicked out of heaven but has dreams of returning one day. Again, you can check out the other video if you're interested because there's a lot to unpack there. So, with all that being said, you're probably wondering what Paimon's relation is to her demon. In the Ars Goetia, the demon Paimon is one of the most powerful demons of hell and is listed as a king. He is seen wearing a crown, is the most loyal demon to Lucifer and a master of manipulation. But wait, it gets better. One of the demon Paimon's powers is to maliciously inflict severe psychological and spiritual torments upon his victims by reconstructing traumatic events as well as terrifying visions and nightmares. Guess what power was just used in the most recent story quest of Genshin Impact? Is that so? Let me give it a try. <laughs> Paimon's right. I too experience some unpleasant flashbacks. Are you sure? I wouldn't exactly call it fun. Fair enough. Go ahead. Crazy, huh? Oh my god, it feels so nice to talk normally. Dude, I had to film that first part at like 3 in the morning. I didn't want to wake up my roommates, but <laughs> it's 9 o'clock right now. Anyway, but what did Paimon see and what does this mean? Well, for starters, Paimon is most certainly a god. Putting the namesake aside, let's not forget Mona wasn't able to read Paimon's fate. The only other person's fate she couldn't read was Venti and the Traveler. Venti is a god who most likely prevented his fate from being read, and the Traveler is from another world whose fate is unable to be read. But what about Paimon? 
By which measure did she take to prevent her truths from being revealed? Well, we know Paimon is shrunk to bat due to her being affected by Ermin Soul, so this could indicate that she prevented her fate from being read. But what truths could she want concealed? Well, according to one little melazine, Haha! Interesting! But to my eyes, Paimon is like a little rainbow balloon floating in the air, and her string seems to extend upward to somewhere above the sky itself. This is why we love the melazines, huh? It feels like a near certainty at this point that Paimon hails from Celestia. But just how deep does this connection run? Putting that aside and circling back to the story quest, it could very well be that what Paimon saw when she touched the rock was nothing. While she appeared affected by the rock's power, it could very well be that she simply knew what the rock was capable of as its power may have come from her. But why then would she intentionally pick that rock? Yeah, that's a dang good question, feller. Uh, look, I think what may have happened is she was wondering what the rock was doing there knowing full well what it's capable of. So she touched the rock and started acting sheepishly in an effort to manipulate the traveler and ride the rides the fuck ridesly to also touch it because don't forget the demon paimon is a master at manipulating humans to do what he wants so let's say paimon really is from celestia which god is she and what are her intentions this is tricky for a couple of different reasons because while the gods we associate with celestia are the likes of the archons and the shades and the primordial one there are other gods that should reside there, and technically anyone with a vision can ascend to Celestia and become a god as seen with someone like Vanessa. So while Paimon could be some ancient god with a long and complicated history with Celestia and its secrets, she could very well have simply been just a nigga with a vision in her past life. But one thing to note is the demon's Paimon fierce loyalty to his master Lucifer, that of which exceeds all the other demons. So think about it, if Paimon is from Celestia, naturally that would make her master the primordial one. And who are the most loyal gods to the Primordial One? Presumably the Four Shades, seeing as the Four Shades were quite literally made by the Primordial One from itself. So it stands to reason that they are the most loyal to it. Of the Four Shades, we only really know one for sure, and that's Istaroth, the god of time and wind. And she can't be Paimon unless of course she's taken on another form, otherwise Venti would have clocked her in two seconds. Another likely candidate for a shade, however, is the sustainer who seems to be the sort of face of the heavens currently. I doubt she's Paimon because it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me, okay? <laughs> so that leaves the other two shade spots. Who are they? No clue. We literally know nothing about who the other two could have been. I've seen some theories say that Zhang Li could be a shade, but if he's a shade, I'm a shade. It's thought that the shades could have a connection with the artifact domain's life, death, time, void, and logic. Let's assume the Primordial One's domain is life, and we know Istaroth's is time. The sustainer could probably be logic given she sustains the principles and makes a comment on mankind's irrigation. This leaves both death and void unfilled. The void one is interesting, because the void realm was inherently toxic to the heaven and the human realm given it's where the abyss resides. So if Paimon can't be void, then that only leaves death. So is Paimon the god of death? Eh, who knows. It's quite literally impossible to say right now given we know so little, but it would be cool. It would most likely make her one of the strongest entities into vats even amongst the shades, but why then is she masquerading as a flying leprechaun is completely unknown and this doesn't give any answers as to why that could be. It could also be that Paimon is simply someone who is constructed alternatively and bears no ill will, in which case, yikes man, we have been pointing a lot of fingers at Paimon. But, but that's boring man. Make her evil, man. I want to feel the sting of betrayal in this game. Something we have... Please don't turn into fairy tale, man. Just please, man. Just please. Pro, please. For anyone that watched that show, my memory of this might be completely incorrect, but I remember in one of the last seasons, Grey and Juvia were like, dead. The, the, the show gave them the whole nine yards. They, oh, I love you. I love you too. And then they, they died. And then the camera zoomed out. And I was like, oh my goodness, finally, this, this is the first time in the history of the world that someone has died a fairy tale. And then like three episodes later, you find out that they, that, that, that they lived, that they lived because they like did a blood transfusion in secret. <laughs> I was like, oh fuck, I ain't not, I ain't not gonna kill these niggas, bro. If they, if, they, if they have the capabilities of doing blood transfusions on the fly despite having no medical knowledge, I was like, oh, that's over, bro. Man, it got so bad by the end of the season, bro. One of the characters could have been blind, deaf, and a quadriplegic, but if, they, if the situation called for them to go faster than the speed of sound to save their friend, they would have summoned the internal monologue. <laughs> I'm doing this for my friends! And then they would have gone 80,000 miles a second to save that dude as a, as a blind, deaf quadriplegic. That's how bad it was. Please don't make it like that. Please, thank you.